Welcome everybody once again to another edition of RDA Tech Q&A. You've got questions, we've got guesses. Um, with me tonight, as always, is my producer, Mike Gearman. Hello. Long and storied history and electrical wisdom jiggets. As do myself, I'm Nash. I've got over a decade's worth of electrical wisdom jizzit thing. A smart man. So um, we'll be taking your questions, as always. If you have questions for us here on the show that you'd like potentially to answer, if you don't know how slot A goes into tab B, or that's wrong. Tab B goes into slot A. Actually, your sex life is your sex life. Actually, man. tab A goes into slot A, tab A. This is why I can't do Ikea. Um, if you have questions for us, Send those to requests at radio.air.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. We'll attempt to answer those for you. Um, but first, we have some news to talk about tonight. First, I, I, this is both tech news and a giant pet peeve of mine. And we're starting with the story everybody saw this week. It made the headlines. Everybody was fretting. The sky was falling. Oh, my God. But we don't cover politics. No, not that one. That's an entirely different mess, and no, we have no idea how to fix that shit. Um, and we could be talking about any of a dozen stories with that. Yes. Um, I was talking. I'm referring specifically to Tesla. Ah. Oh God, I sneeze, but I don't. I hate that. <laughs> there we go. All done. That's very annoying. You just th you sit there, you think you have to sneeze, but you're not sure. But then you do. It's annoying. It could, could have been worse. You could have had one of those high-pitched little cute girl sneezes. I never do that. I always do these loud <laughs> noises. I don't know why. Yes, but if you were going to, on the air, it would be when it would happen. If I, if, if I ever try to run from a movie monster and hide someplace and I need to sneeze, I'm never, I'm going to die. I'm going to die because I cannot stop it. Anyway, talking about Tesla this week, and the reason we're talking about Tesla is you may have seen a number of headlines from a number of reputable news outlets claiming that the first self-driving fatality had occurred. Yeah, I saw those and read into the story and like, was he even self-driving when the crash? And that's happened? that's the problem. And and when I say very reputable, I'm not talking about stuff like The Verge. No, no. New York I, Times. I'm talking about the fucking New York Times. Now, if this has been in the daily news or uh, the mail online, it'd be okay. Yeah, we're 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 taking it with a huge grain of salt. The Times, we expect to sort of get their shit together and get it right. This, all right, let's break down what happened. This fellow was driving one of the new Tesla Model S. Or is the, is, what's, the Model S is the new one, right? I believe so. Yeah. I, I can't afford Teslas, <laughs> so I don't necessarily keep track of their versioning. I know. The Tesla Model S has a new feature on it. Uh, aside from being a revolutionary electro electric car, Long travel times, recharge, got the big screen on it, doodly doodly doo buttons. Ooh, it's shiny. I would like to say, let me interject something here. If Tesla, if anyone at Tesla is watching this and wants to send me a car for review <laughs> purposes, I will gladly do an hour long plus review of the car. But well, there, there's, there's, there's the man. If you're listening, Elon Musk and Tesla, send Mike a car. Um, <clears throat> The Tesla is got a lot of news, and in this model, it has a feature on it, which is called autopilot. Yep. And when people hear autopilot, what they think is, oh, it drives you itself. Like that episode of The Simpsons. Right. It does not. What the autopilot is, however, is a very sophisticated cruise control system. What it allows you to do is, once you're on the highway, instead of just with typical cruise control, you hit the cruise control button and you stay at a steady speed until you tap the brake, what this does is, using cameras and radar, it detects the vehicles around you, 
it detects if the car in front of you is going to stop. And if the car in front of you slows down, your it car slows down, slows down automatically. Yeah. Um, it can which pretty, is which is useful when you're in the zone. It can also follow the map. It, it has a general idea of where you're going, but it does have some limitations to the point that when you activate auto autopilot, it even specifically tells you, "Do not take your hands off the wheel." It's driver assistance not self-driving. It does not take yeah. the entire process. Now, what happened here was, this was a fatal crash. Um, he was using the autopilot system and a truck crossed the highway with a white trailer. Now, the camera apparently could not differentiate between the side of the white tractor trailer and the sky. It didn't recognize the truck as an obstruction, and it went straight into it. It was a T-bone incident. Gotcha, gotcha. It was tragic. It was obviously a software bug. Um, now, Tesla has also stressed the autopilot is a beta feature. And again, do not take your attention off the road while using it. It's not self-driving. And yet, we get these headlines. self driving Tesla. Not this model. And I want to play to, to scroll down into the, the article, the very last line, the final line of the article, which no one ever reads. It's right here. It is noted when a driver activated system and acknowledgement pops up explaining autopilot mode is quote, unassist feature that requires you to keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times. What are we do? What are you doing here, Tech Report? What the fuck are you doing? Now it's true we do have self driving in the works. Google is yes. famously working on this, as are a number of other companies. What self driving means is you don't do shit. You get in the vehicle. You push a button that says, "I would like to go here," and the car takes you there. It goes through traffic. It takes all the twists and turns. It understands how to start and stop. It follows all the traffic rules. It gets you from point A to point B. And you are a passenger. That is self-driving. Yes. Welcome to Johnny Cap. Get your ass to Mars. Clay, get these people out! <laughs> Benny! Ah! God damn it. Now, now I'm on a Schwarzenegger loop. I've fallen into a Schwarzenegger loop. Um, why this is a bad thing to do. This is tech reporting. Tech reporting re relies on facts and not sensationalism. This isn't... Th this is how people That's get... even in the business sector. If this was a front page, I could understand maybe a little bit more sensationalism, but it's the business section. This is where people get their information that they need to make decisions. Had this been an actual Google self-driving car, which I want to point out have not been approved for a nationwide rollout yet. They're only very carefully monitored test programs at this point. There are no Google self-driving already yeah. set and ready to go. And, and the Google car has been in a couple accidents, but the accidents it's been in have not been in its, its fault. And regardless, had it been one of those self-driving cars, that would have been an important distinction. What this does is cast a shadow over something that's not even related to what we're talking about here. Yeah. It's like saying, um, airplane crash kills 50 when we're talking about a boat sinking. It's you might and you might think I'm I'm nitpicking here, but it is an important distinction. One will determine the course of how uh, technology is regulated, how technology develops, how technology is invested in. Now, I'll, I want to personally point out I have no horse in this race. I not I don't care one way or another about self driving cars, likely because I'm not going to be able to a fucking afford one. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, unless you or I win the lottery, yeah. I'm probably going to be driving my same pickup truck for the foreseeable future. That's just how it is. It's a good truck. It runs. It's got less than 50,000 miles on it. It's a good, it, I'm driving my truck. Fuck you, self-driving. But this is very obnoxious, especially in terms of the media. This was clickbait. This was plain and simple. They put up this sensationalist headline that a self-driving car was involved in a fatal accident. And it wasn't. But I guess saying advanced cruise control was involved in a self-driving accident doesn't get as much people to click on it, does it? No. I mean, he could have been eating a Snickers bar. They'd say Snickers bar involved in a self-driving accident. Exactly! It wasn't... That's not... No! Now, now, admittedly, the fact that it couldn't tell the, the white trailer oh, yeah. on the truck from the sky, I mean, you tell me that, I look at it and go, okay, I can, I can foresee what the problem is, having done years ago some similar type work in college, where it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's how, it's how strong the signal bounce back th type things are and things like that. So I can see what it's, you know, got going on there. And white was going, um, you know, yeah. It was either either paint was absorbing it, uh, or it was going. I, I'm just not telling the difference, you know, cameras or radar. Something failed, obviously. But I can I can see where they need to look in their code with some reasonable assumptions. But to the the assumption everyone would get from this headline is one of these autonomous cars has caused, and it hasn't. This was to get people. Not yet, anyway. No, this was to they'll, get. They'll, eventually, there'll be one. There will eventually, but this was to get people to click, and that's shameful and it's horrible. And I would expect as much from The Verge because let's face it, The Verge isn't very much of a tech reporting site anyway. I would expect as much from them, but not from the New York Times. Yeah, you're the New York fucking Times. You know better. I just, it, fuck. I, 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 had this just been confined to one place, I wouldn't even be addressing it here. But if you Google this story, if you look up what happened, you're going to see every fucking headline was self-driving car in fatal crash. No, no, it wasn't. I saw it at Mike.com. I saw it at a couple other uh, sites. I don't think I saw it on the register and good on those snarky motherfuckers. I'll tell you what, they might be assholes, but the register is some of the best tech reporting on the internet in the world. Anyway, um, let's talk about the other big news, the good news and the bad news for AMD. Um, the good news is it's a fairly solid little card we're talking about. Yeah, the good news for AMD is they are poised on the brink of claiming the mid-range market. I was going to say of relevance again. Well, relevance, yeah, that, that, that too. Oh boy, yeah, they, they've been having a hard, hard time. To give you folks a little bit of background, AMD is the main graphics card competitor to NVIDIA, which makes the GeForce. A AMD makes the Radeon. They have been, for the better part of two decades, the, the competition when it comes to graphics cards on computers and not just for video games also for high-end production uh for um cuda and other uses of video cards because video cards amazingly do a lot more than just video okay. now the same technology has also been translated into things like high level computation um even some certain kinds of servers can make use of enhanced graphics cards and of course there's 3d production and video production, lots of things in which these cards are involved. It's always been AMD and, in, and NVIDIA with Intel as a distant third. The Intel's graphics are sort of like, well, it's on the computer, we'll just use it. Yeah, Intel graphics are what you use when you're in a business office. Right. Now, for a long time, AMD, I, I'd say let, probably since the GTX, oh God, 
How long has AMD been having problems? I'd say since the 600 series. I'd say six, maybe 700 series, if I'm being charitable. Yeah, it's been about at least five years. AMD has been significantly lagging behind uh, NVIDIA in terms of performance. NVIDIA has always been the speed leader, and when it comes to gaming, speed sells. And it wasn't even just in the high-end range. Uh, NVIDIA's mid-range and even their low-range cards, not only were they faster, but they were better uh, at handling power uh, demands, meaning they, were, they drew less power from the wall and still maintained a higher performance. This was kicking AMD's butt. Finally, AMD announced its new architecture, the Polaris. And, well, I'd say new architecture, but it's, it's still a derivative. It's just shrunk to 14 nanometers. But regardless, this was a chance for AMD to, to leapfrog ahead. Yeah, they released the first card in this series, the RX 480. Now, it's not the fastest card. That's not why it's everyone's got its attention on it. What it is, is a $200 gaming card that not only screams at 1080p resolution, but is capable of handling VR. This got everyone's attention because at $200, this is poised to be a mid-range blowout. It, it could easily topple uh, NVIDIA because NVIDIA has nothing in the $200 range currently that can match or the price, price and power of the RX 480. They have $200 cards, but their $200 cards are slightly above. They have $300 cards that blow the for it, but that's slightly... For price and performance, the four, the RX 480 slotted into a sweet spot yeah. in the market. This is why everyone was incredibly excited. And when the reviews came out, people were still excited because they backed up AMD's claims of performance. This is true. Until Tom's Hardware got a hold of it. Tom's Hardware is a wonderful website. If you're looking to buy any sort of tech hardware, mostly computer stuff. Tom's Hardware has reviews for everything. And they tell you they get buying guides, part picker guides, great stuff. Wonderful website, very thorough. So thorough that they actually tested the power consumption of the RX 480. Video cards draw power much like the rest of the system. Uh, part of their power comes from the power supply. There's an actually a dedicated cord that comes off the computer's power supply just for most video cards. Yeah. Not all video cards. And it's anywhere from depend on low end cards, it's for four pin usually, up to six pin or eight pin, sometimes even more. Dual six pin, dual eight pin on some of the big nasty cards. Those are the crazy fucking cards, but. Those are the cards where you need liquid cooling for your house. The rest of the power is provided by the slot that the card sits in. That's called the PCIe slot. That's yes. where all the expansion cards, and if you have them, most of them in your computer go into one of those PCIe slots. Open architecture. Part of the power goes through there. Now, those slots are rated to handle, at, on average, at a current, at, over time, those cards are rated to deliver 75 watts. If the card requires any more than 75 watts of continuous power, it's supposed to draw it from that cable from the power supply. That's where it gets its extra power. Now, if it if it were to draw 76 watts, no one would probably notice. It'd be right. within the margin of error. You go, oh, maybe that's just this one card. Try a different card. Oh, it's 74 watts. If there is an occasional power spike and it's drawing, say, maybe 80 watts for a few seconds, that's okay. There's a plus or minus. There are fluctuations yeah. that are allowed. And and some of your some of your motherboard manufacturers will rate it a little bit higher because they've got better manufacturing procedures or a better setup on their cards. They can say it'll support this. Right. But the PCIe standard. Standard. Exactly. The, the standard one, is 75. The one that all manufacturers are supposed to adhere to at the minimum is 75 watts. The RX 480 was consistently drawing 
somewhere on the order of 80 to 86 watts. I want to say I saw it peaked at 90. It actually. peaks at 90, but as an average, yeah, 85, see, 80, 85. What this comes down to is the RX 480 is drawing way more power across your motherboard than it, your motherboard might be rated to handle. This is bad. Now, if you have, if you've got a super high-end gaming, four-phase power, all the fucking Japanese uh, capacitors, all of this happy horse shit on your motherboard, you might be fine. But if you're like most people on a budget and you buy a computer off the rack at a store that's using one of a standard main board that's not designed for super high-end shit, it's just made to work, and you decide, hey, I want to play games on this, and you slap an RX 480 in there, you might kill your motherboard with this card. Yeah. At the very least, you're probably going to see sound interference. Oh, yeah. That, and this is something, if you, uh, even on the computer you have right now, you may notice this. If you ever, like, turn off all, all right, Turn off all other sounds in your house. Don't have anything playing. And turn your speakers up. Just make sure that there's nothing playing through them. And move your mouse around the screen or scroll up and down a web page. And you might hear a soft little err, err, err. That's power bleeding over into your sound. That's bad. That, that, that's, that's art that, um, Audio artifacting, I think that's yes. what it's called. It's an audio artifact. That's that sound crossing over. Watts through your PCIe slot instead of 75. That's much more power that will potentially bleed over. And could maybe kill a motherboard. Too much. Motherboards have ratings to deter. That's why there is a standard. So that nobody can accidentally put make a card that should be used. That could be. They have standards so people can make cards that can be used in all computers without having to worry about it, without having a specialization. If they don't follow the standard, then something could blow out because now, someone's asking for too much power. Now here's the way AMD can get around this. AMD, like Nvidia, partners with a lot of people to make cards. So you'll have an MSI branded in uh, uh, AMD card. And it, a, yeah, MSI Radeon, uh, EVGA Radeon, etc. You'll have all these. So right. they could manufacture a different format on the card, effectively, a different structure on the card where they're drawing more power. They put instead of a six pin on there, they put, they put an, an eight, eight pin, pin on there. That would be the simple, and, easy solution for this problem. And would probably solve it. And so that's why when you go to sites, once, once this card is out and there's a lot of different models for it from different manufacturers, um, you'll go to something like Newegg and you'll see that the name brand ones, MSI, EVGA, etc., uh, will have a higher rating, star rating, because they'll be, well, this is considered more reliable. And then there'll be the, the BOG standard AMD one, which will be, I don't know, three stars. In, in, in any event, Right now, people who are looking to pick up the AMD RX 480, don't. Not right now. Wait until either AMD addresses this themselves and replaces the 6-pin connector on the board with an 8-pin connector to allow more power draw through the power supply and not the PCIe mainboard connection. Or buy an app, buy uh, one that's not made by AMD, buy an RX 480 that's made by Gigabyte or Asus or Asus or ACES, however they fucking say it, or EVGA or MSI. What are the other manufacturers? Because right now, while this card has got some really good numbers for budget buyers who want good gaming performance, they can't afford to spend a lot it does have a serious issue that could end up killing some of those budget buyers' computers. Wait. Hold off on the RX 480 until at least uh, another manufacturer, not an A, don't buy one directly from AMD, buy one from another one. 
but hold off. You may end up spending another $20, $25 on it. But this, this was this, it's not a death blow, but it is some, it's bad news. Yeah. This, this was a self-inflicted wound on AMD. I don't know how this got and and, and could have been, and it, and it could have been solved, as we said, by putting an eight pin power. Oh yeah. Rather than six pin. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, a couple extra phases you got there going on. You'd be, you'd be golden. Yeah. It's just, you fucked up. Our last one tonight is fucking Apple. Fucking Apple. So, long, long ago, yeah. in a galaxy far, far away, uh, Apple blew back onto the scene after a long, hard slog in the wilderness by returning Steve Jobs to his position as Apple CEO. And the very first thing he did was he envisioned and released the iMac. The very first iMac came out, I think this was around 96, 97, late 90s. And it was huge. It revolutionized oh, yes, Apple. Absolutely. And one of the big things the iMac did was it got rid of the floppy drive. It just totally. Mainly because their thinking was CDs had become a bit of a standard at that point. Even though CD rewriters were still another good four or five years away, CDs had become a standard. Faster internet connections have become a standard. And floppy drives only held 1.44 megabytes. That wasn't a lot of data. So as far as Apple was concerned, the floppy drive was superfluous. We needed to move away from it. And, you, and then lots of little cottage industries popped up that allowed you to, it was what, online floppies? That gave you enough storage space. This is where cloud storage actually start, got its got started was when Apple got rid of the floppy drive. That's when they started, people started storing their data online and that started a yeah. whole new industry. And let's face it, the, the floppy drive needed to go at that point. It was, it was well, useless. Yeah. It, it was, it was holding everything back. Everything. I mean, did you ever see an installation of windows 98 on floppy? Yep. Fucking stack of floppies this fucking long. I think what was that, 100 floppies or something like that? I don't remember. I never had to do one. I just saw the stack. Just a ridiculous stack of fucking floppy disks. To yeah, I've, I've got a coworker who still has a box of floppies. You know, this, by this, by that, of work data. They were, yeah, please insert disk 38. So Apple made Where a smart... disk 38 go to? Apple made a very smart move by getting rid of the floppy drive. Now they're about to make another. Everyone is rumoring that for the iPhone 7, Apple's going to make another big move to remove something that has been considered a standard when it comes to smartphones. The three and a half millimeter jack. Your for headphone For those of you who jack. don't know what we're talking about, it's the little headphone jack. On the top, the headphone jack that is on top of every phone that is the aux input on every stereo system that's in every car. The, the, the standard connector that has yes. been used for home electronics for, for since the Walkman. The one that everybody has used, it's a standard that has stood up the test of time. And the reason it has stood up to the test of time is there's never really been anything. It, it's a question of building a better mousetrap. Sure, you could, but why would you? The one you have works just fine. There's never been any big demand. The biggest innovation I have seen on headphone jacks is, I'll put this up to the camera and maybe people can see, there are three little oh, rings. Hello. Well, that, that's for you. There are two cameras here. Okay. Yeah. There are three little rings on this. And that middle ring, I believe it's the middle ring, one of these rings, controls the head the microphone button that adds a microphone yeah. to this that's been the biggest innovation and yet it's still compatible with the old kind but what now what apple is proposing to do according to all of these people who are seeing it is they want to replace they just want to get rid of that jack entirely and if you want to use a headphone you have to use a lightning headphone 
well, hang on. Because what I'm seeing on other stories is it's not going to be a lightning interface. It's going to be a separate interface that's sort of magnetically locked on the device. Well, I've heard that. I've heard lightning with it. The lightning interface is what Apple uses instead of USB or USB-C like everybody else uses because they're fucking Apple. It's a proprietary user interface. It's not like your USB uh, adapt, USB inputs. And you, don't worry, you'll still be able to use your old headphones. You'll just need a dongle. Yeah. Well, the, the, the big issue with, uh, of course, if they go lightning, is that everything that wants, any, any third party that wants to make headphones for Apple at that point would have to go through and be certified by Apple. Yeah, this is and pay Apple money. They have to pay for the, the right to use the patents on on lightning connectors. And uh, that would result in headphones that aren't really any better in producing sound, but are better in producing profit. Yes, because it would mean all of these accessory manufacturers would have to pay the Apple tax. And they would pass those savings on to nobody because there won't be any, but you'll pay more. And the other big issue with, with of course, this is because it's now all digital audio, they could put something in the code that says, oh, this, this audio source you're listening to, this MP3, mm -hmm. um, we don't recognize where you got that from. We're not going to play that. It's, it, it is a stupid, stupid, well, no, in terms of profit, I'm sure it'll be very profitable because Apple has always been able to sell uh, uh, ice bakers to Inuits. I think they're going to get a lot of blowback on this one. And I, if, if I were to predict anything about Apple products, I would say that the first phone that ships with this instead of the headphone jack is going to be uh, selling less than they expect. And it may be the worst selling iPhone in uh, the last five years. Oh, and, and even better, the lightning jack on the iPhone is also the charging jack. Right, so you won't be able to listen, to, unless you get a separate special Splitter, somehow, Apple or, yeah. dongle, you won't be able to charge and listen to your phone. At the, yeah, you won't be able to charge your phone and listen to your headphones at the same time. Which, I don't know about you, but when I'm on flights, when I'm traveling, it's, but when I'm in my car, on long drives. That's what you want to do. I plug in the headphone jack to my stereo so I can yep. have the output. And then I plug in the power of the phone because I'm using my phone to navigate sometimes. Or I just want to keep the phone powered. When I'm flying, I have a battery pack for my phone because on a long flight, your phone's going to die. Now, if, if Apple were to finally adopt NFN, that's what it is, NFN? The one where you can set it on a pad and it charges, you don't have to plug it in. Yeah, near or yeah, wireless charging. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't want to do that because they didn't invent that. They would have to pay someone else for the patents for that shit. Yeah, it might be Samsung. I'm not sure. My Nexus can do that. I've never bothered with it. I just bought a, a little generic cradle on Amazon for like 10 bucks and put it here on my desk so I could use my phone as my clock. That wireless NFC, NFC, not NFC. NFC. Near field, yeah, near... Near something. field charging. Near, near field charging, yeah, wireless charging. It's... Uh, this is this is very... Th this is a bad... What, with the floppy, you could at least argue that the floppy was obsolete and better technology had surpassed it. This was true. But you can't argue that for headphones. Yeah, the better technology for, the, the, for that jack is... The quarter inch jack. Yeah, well, with headphones, all a headphone jack is, is a wire. That's all it is. It's finishing a connection. None of the technology for for the music production is anywhere in this. this. There's no real device here. There's just some magnets and wire. That's why they're so cheap. That's why they're so easy to use. All it is, is an, all the headphone jack is, is an open wire. 
and you're plugging one wire to another to finish the circuit. It's very simple, it's very elegant, it allows for a lot of compatibility through across the industry. Everything uses a 3.5 millimeter jack. And here's another thing, people have also uh, said that you could also use Bluetooth headphones, but guess what? Not only are those more expensive, you have to charge those. So you're going, ah, I'm listening, I'm listening, I can't hear anything. Oh, my Bluetooth headphones ran out of battery. 10 minutes into my job because I forgot to fill on the charger last night. And Bluetooth, not only does Bluetooth drain the headphones, they Bluetooth is it's a radio signal that your phone has to put out and it drains power from your phone as well. If you're using Bluetooth, your your phone is going to charge is going to battery is going to run down faster. Not only that, there are some companies and some uh governments you, you're not allowed to turn Bluetooth on, on your phone. Yeah. Because Bluetooth is a huge security hole. You can, you can hack Bluetooth so fucking easily. It's sad. So yeah, this, this fucking Apple, I really hope this is just one of those rumors and that we, but this has been coming from a lot of different well, sources. Apparently, there's there's a, a dev kit out uh, for it. Uh, uh, so, no. no. Well, that's going to cost Apple. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. See, when I don't get, you know, I'm just looking at the dev kit and the, the amount of space the circuitry takes up. And, uh, you know, convert digital audio to digital to analog. And I'm, I'm not thinking they're saving any space. I'm really not thinking they're saving any space. This is when they're trying to disguise change for its own sake as innovation. When it's just bullshit to get them, get you to pay more money for Apple Apple certified accessories. Android's looking better and better all the time. All right. Now that we've covered the news, let's cover your questions. Once again, if you have questions for us here, um, go ahead and send those to requests at radio.air.com. We will attempt to answer those questions for you. I'm gonna start off with one from Ashley tonight. Uh, hey, Nash and Mike, ever since both my desktop and laptop upgraded from Win 8.1 to Windows 10, I've been completely freezing at the most inconvenient of times, more frequently on my desktop. I can't even move my mouse when it happens, and I need to reboot the entire system to fix it. This especially happens when I'm gaming or in Skype calls. I look this up, and it, not only is this a common problem, the result seems to point toward a driver error of some kind, which I believe at least twice a day, my video driver will randomly restart itself. Everything is up to date as far as I can tell. Anything I can do to fix this forever, or am I simply stuck dealing with this in the foreseeable future? Okay, so my first thought is video drivers. Now, there's two places you can look for video drivers. You can look at the manufacturer's site, mm -hmm. and you can look on Microsoft. And they're probably going to have different versions of the video drivers. Mm -hmm. I would check to see what you have, and then check to see what's at, those, at their sites. Because what Microsoft, Microsoft says, oh, there's updated drivers. They may be two or three development loops behind uh, the manufacturer. And we're, manufacturers put out version 12, and Microsoft is still saying, oh, yeah, version 10 is your greatest. So that's the first thing to check, is see which one you have compared to those two. And if you have one of them, try the other. And if you have neither of them, try the manufacturers. I'm looking up, there's, uh, now quite often, a lot of people don't know what hardware they get in their off-the-shelf computers. Sure. Um, there is um, a software you can get that is free, that will tell you who made what, and uh, if you're trying to find, and this, this works, if you ever try to find drivers for something, and you're like, what is this unidentified driver shit? I don't know what this is. There's a little program you can get. It's called HW Info. And let me yep. put this up on the screen here. HW Info, and you can find that at hwinfo.com. 
it will, because every piece of hardware has a little chip in it that says, hey, this is what I am. Thanks for asking. And that's what this software does. It, it talks to your hardware and asks it what it is, and your hardware tells it, and then you know. And it'll even give you manufacturers' websites that you can link to and tell you how to find drivers for your stuff. It won't download. It's not one of those driver thing, software things. This just talks to your computer, asks what's what, and then tells you where to go to get the proper software you need. It's super helpful, especially if you have a computer you bought off the shelf and you don't know every little individual, what is this network yeah. driver, what is this thing? It's now, very useful. To go with that, the other thing I would do is hit your start, hit your menu start, you know, your, your, your Windows button and type in in the, in the run field device manager. Yeah. The, what you're going to look for there is not necessarily, like, this is where you can find out your driver information as well. But yeah. first thing to look for there is anything that has a little yellow marker by it that says warning. That's a, that's a warning symbol. Or a little red marker by it, which says, I don't know what the hell this is. Yeah. So those are the devices you're going to want to look at first if you have any. If you have any of those, see if the, if the software Nash recommended can help you find drivers for those. Uh, because, you know, especially the conflict, if it can't find, if it says, if it has a red warning, that's something that says, I don't know what this is. I'm not doing anything with it, but it's here so you know. So that's probably not an issue for you. It's the stuff with the warnings where it's going, I have a conflict. I think I'm talking to this. I'm using the driver to talk to this. It's not responding properly. Now, there, there was one other thing Ashley mentioned in her email, she, that this was happening to both her desktop and her laptop. Yeah. And uh, she doesn't mention this, but Ashley, do you have a wireless printer? Oh, yeah, good one, good one. Because one of the, one of the things you look for in hardware troubleshooting is common issues. A laptop and a desktop are two completely different pieces of hardware. If they're both having the same trouble, you look for something they both have in common. And in this it, case, if it's a driver error and they're both trying to talk to a wireless printer and that driver doesn't work quite so well with Windows 10, that might be your problem. And now you're thinking, why would a printer cause my video to freeze? And that's because when drivers conflict, they do crazy things. Uh, two computers ago, I had a TV card in my computer. You know, the card where you plug the cable into the TV because I didn't have a TV. And so I'd watch TV on, on my computer. And it conflicted with my printer. When I closed my TV tuner application, I would have to go in to uh, kill the process for it. Otherwise, I couldn't print ever. Yeah. Just, so it's, it's really strange. You'd think they have nothing to do with each other. Why is this happening? Because it's intercepting a call. Somehow something's happening. They're thinking, oh, no one uses this function. We'll use this function. Or it's just something's not unloading properly. So now it's just blocking something. And I think the last thing here is the, the very, what? Do you have something else? I was also going to say there's another possibility, and it could be a common alloy between the two. Check your antivirus software, make sure it's up to yeah. date. Because if you're having similar issues on two machines, you might have a virus. Mm. You might have something that's just going, uh, I'm going to screw with their stuff. Yeah, I, I think the last thing to check on this is because you did an in place upgrade, and this is one of those annoying things about Microsoft upgrades. Because you did an in-place upgrade from Windows 8.1 to Windows 10, something lingering from Windows 8 on those old systems might have carried over. And you might have to do a full system wipe and reinstall. I'm sorry, but it's one of those annoying fucking things you might have to do. Now, fortunately, uh, Windows 10 does allow for this. You just, when uh, your system starts up, uh, it's F12 for repair? I believe so. Yeah, you hit F12 when your system, when you first get the logo of your manufacturer on screen, hit F12. It, it might be BIOS dependent, machine dependent. So look, if you see, if it's F2, F8, F12, one of those. That's not one of those things that's standardized either. Might be escape. Might be, yeah. Just hit those buttons. Start pushing F buttons to see what happens. Now, 
Um, find the one that allows you to go into your repair options and then look through it and see if you can do a, a reset. And this will, the one, and sadly enough, this will clean off all your, your old data. So it'll be a full, fresh reinstall. So back up your data. Yeah, back up your data first. It'll be a fresh reinstall, but it might, if all else fails, that will solve the problem. Yeah, and uh, by the way, that's, that's not your, that should be your last step, obviously. That should be your last that's, thing. That's the last step. That's um, the last step. Uh, what Nash said about commonality of equipment, I would also, is there a device you transfer between machines, a special mouse you use between two because you yeah. really love the mouse and it's expensive? I would check that. Uh, external hard drives sometimes cause strange issues, um, especially if you're doing encryption. If you're doing anything where you're encrypting your external hard drive, um, I have plenty of experience with that causing massive issues with all sorts of random things. There are so many ways Windows can go wrong. So many ways! Let's skip down to uh, Emily Lance Johnson had a question for us. Um, hi guys, <clears throat> not so much a tech support question as a general tech question. Not long ago, my television, the one which I usually watch most things I watch, including this show, met with an ugly end. The particulars aren't important. Gravity was involved. Sounds like a wall-mounted system. But I started looking into getting a replacement, and every compatible TV was a smart one. Having had the ill-advisedness of the Internet of Things drilled into my head, I'm reluctant to get a smart TV, but it looks like I don't have a choice. Is that the case? If I want to get a big TV, am I stuck with a smart TV? You might well be. Yeah. But... You don't really have to use the smart functions. There's nothing that says yeah. you have to hook it up. You can plug power into it. You can plug your Chromecast into it. And you don't have to use the smart functions. I would do your research because some of them might go, well, without these functions, you can't do anything other than, you know, very narrow subset. But yeah. It, this has been an annoying trend, especially with 4K. Um, every manufacturer is making their TVs smart. Only if a subset of manufacturers aren't making smart TVs. And most of the reviews on those, I looked, I went and I looked for a good reviewed non-smart TV. Most of those aren't really great. Um, this is very, very frustrating, I know. And I'm sorry. I, I wish I had a great solution for this, but this is one, th this is something customers are having to suffer through a lot right now. In fact, I think if someone out there made a TV that's like, hey, this motherfucker's just a TV, plug whatever the fuck you want into it, they would be making bank right yeah. now. Now, part of it, uh, if you end up with an Internet of Things TV, you know, uh, connected TV, uh, there there are ways to, to, you know, you don't have to connect it. I would, you know, block its MAC address at your firewall. Don't let it talk out. If it has a actual physical hardware jack, I would plug a loop back into it. Well, that's getting a little complicated for most people. Yeah, but that, that's me. <laughs> I mean, I literally, if it had a hard, if it had a hardware uh, Ethernet jack in there, I would plug a loopback adapter into that so fast it'd be ridiculous. It'd be like, I can't talk to shit, but I can't talk to shit. It's pretty much I would not configure any of, it, although some of them kind of require you to do so. If you can at all possible, skip skip through it. <sighs> if it, it's. It, it is just, it is frustrating out there to find a good quality television that doesn't have a smart feature on it. Now, that said, with televisions, if they discover a flaw in their implementation of things, they're more likely to provide pushes to get patches and things like that, you know, for a five, six hundred, eight hundred dollar television, whatever you buy, then... Well, some people, you know, have that much money to spend. I don't right now, but... No, I'm saying they'd be more likely to, please... I have a Samsung television. Over, over the Internet of Things light bulb that cost $10. They're never going to patch light. They might start going, well, the new, next version of light bulb isn't going to have these flaws, but they're not going to push patches out to your existing light bulbs. They patch my TV, and every time they have, they fucked it up. Every I, single time, I Samsung... I didn't say they do it right. <laughs> I said they're more likely to do a patch. Well, that's not a good thing. That's a threat in that case. Every time Samsung has updated my fucking television, they made the motherfucker worse. They keep, and, and because they lost a couple of lawsuits, it's complicated nonsense. They actually pushed patches that removed 
features, including the scheduling feature. <sighs> That's gone. My TV did, was $1,000 um, brand new. That feature is gone. Didn't Sony just lose a, a thing where the federal government said they got to provide refunds to people because of removing uh, functionality from PlayStation's new patches? That's Well, that was an actual lawsuit against them. A yeah. direct one. That wasn't a, a, a precedent set. And the people who law, who got, I think they got what, $10 in games or some shit? Uh, no, you get, I want to say you get like $9 if you had one of the models and you said, oh, one of the reasons I bought it was because of this. And you get 35 or something if you said, I actually, if you, t if you sign the thing saying, I was actually using it. You have So if you bought you it and hadn't done it, it yet, 10 bucks. If you bought it and had done it, 35 uh, let's see. Where's the one about HDMI? They, we have one about HDMI connectors in there. I think that okay. was from Logan. Let's do uh, that yes. one. Um, yeah, this one comes from Logan. Jolan True, Nash and Mike. You're a geek, Logan. I'm just going to put that right out there. You're a big old geek. I'm considering getting a new monitor and using my old monitor as my secondary. Here's the problem. I've only got one HDMI port on my GTX 960 video card. However, I do have three display ports and a DVI port. I'm not all that crazy about DVI because there are too many variants to keep straight. Uh, one set of DVI connected monitor display to post, but no signal when it boots into Windows. Should I get a DisplayPort cord and an HDMI adapter, or just get a DisplayPort to HDMI cord as a single item? I would go the single item. Well... Okay, I would go the single item. The only reason I say that is because I deal with this at work, and where I'm going, okay, I'm getting, I have, I can get the cords easier, and it's one less thing for coworkers to lose. So in that respect. Uh, but if you're at home, I would, yeah, possibly get the cord and the adapter, because then if you ever get go with DisplayPort as your TV, as your monitor, you just take off the adapter. Except. Except. What resolution monitor are you getting, Logan? Ooh, oh yeah, good point. Uh, if you're getting a 1080 monitor, I, I would go with an HDMI to, uh, DV, DisplayPort. to DisplayPort uh, cable, just fine. But... If, if, if that's only if you're getting a 1080p monitor. If you're getting a 1440p or or anything higher than 1080p resolution, you're going to want to stick with DVI. Okay, what, what's I think DisplayPort's max? What's DisplayPort's max? Uh DisplayPort max resolution is, uh, well, it depends on which version. <laughs> ah! What was the last, what, 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 what's the most recent one? Um, okay, DisplayPort 1.4 can do 8K. It's pretty yes. good. All right, then never mind. If, if, if we're talking recent, a 960 is at least DisplayPort 1.3, a GTX 960. So that's at least 4K. That's, you know, if you yeah. want to... DisplayPort 1.3 and 1.4 can do uh, 8K. Um, at... All right. Then more recent DisplayPort, no problem. Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, if uh, DVI is one of those iffy things. There were a couple of different iterations of DVI that weren't entirely compatible, including the cables themselves not being... what, Even though they looked very much the same... You'd be sitting there going, why won't this fucking cable plug into my monitor? And you have to look very carefully to see, oh, the fucking pins don't match. Which was very frustrating. In this case, yeah. Uh, dis I would go for DisplayPort 1.4. Yeah. Just because it's the latest and greatest. And the bugs have pretty much been worked out, so. So, yeah, you if should. just come out, I'd say 1.3, but it's been out well. Getting a single cable is is better because it's less points of failure. Yeah. Uh, anytime you have to add an adapter to a chain of cables, you're adding a point of failure. 
What, what's your what's your longest daisy chain, Nash? Oh shit. Uh, well, let's see what I have right here. Uh, and I say don't do this, except, um, I have a quarter uh, audio jack going to RCA cables, going to uh three point five. Well, the, the RC, going to my um ground loop. Killer, uh, the the ground loop. This uh, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the ground loop killer. Going to three point five millimeter. Going to I believe the audio output from a USB uh audio sound card. That's what everyone here mic here's mic on. <laughs> That's how I have that hooked up to my to 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 the soundboard because. That was the only ground loop killer they had at Radio Shack. It was it was the it was RCA connectors on the end. And I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? So I had to get adapters. So it's a big mess. Don't do what I did. It works, but it's a headache. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we have time for tonight. Um, so we have some complicated ones here. Uh, let's see. That one's too complicated. Sorry, we don't have time. Let's go to Eric's question. He's asking okay. about motherboards. Um, Eric is saying, hi guys. Not so much. Uh, no, that's, that's the wrong one. Uh, uh, yes, I'm upgrading my computer and I know what you want to do is get a motherboard that's compatible with your processor. But I only I noticed there's a lot of range in motherboard pricing as well, and I'm wondering was it worth spending more on the motherboard as prices seem to go from sixty to three hundred dollars. I'm building a gaming PC, and I currently have a GeForce GTX 960. Um, looking at this processor uh, or the K model, as the prices seem close so close together. Okay, let's explain a few things. The processor he's talking about is this one. We're talking about, and oh, do they make this so difficult to under for the lay people to understand? He's talking about buying an Intel Core i i5 6600. Not a bad processor. Or buying a Core i5 6600K. Now, most people who are doing this stuff don't know what the difference is. First off, if you see an uh, Intel processor that has a K on the end of it, uh, on the model name, what this means is it has an unlocked multiplier. And you're like, you just said words and I don't understand what the fuck you're talking about. A 6600K is an unlocked multiplier, meaning it, you can overclock that processor. You can make it run higher that it's rated to at a higher speed than it's actually rated for and get more performance out of the chip. At the side effect of it will draw more power, it will get hotter, you'll need better cooling, and potentially it'll die sooner than if than otherwise. The 6600 without the K does not have an unlocked multiplier. You cannot overclock it without a lot of really in-depth knowledge. Yeah. Um, and even then, it might be iffy. Why would you get a, 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 an overclockable chip? If you really know what you're doing. If, if you are like me, like Mike, like other tech folks, and you know what you're doing, you can overclock your, your processor without much trouble. I have uh, an i7-4930K. It's a six-core E processor. And um, I've got it overclocked fairly well because I know what I'm doing. It also has liquid cooling on the motherfucker. <laughs> if you don't understand any of what I just said, if you don't even know how to overclock, if you don't think you want to risk overclocking because, yes, you can fuck it up and you can kill your, your expensive new component in your system, don't bother buying a, a K. Don't bother buying an unlocked chip. Th there's no point to it for you. You'll save a little bit of money, and that's pretty much it. If you're not going to be overclocking, don't do it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that 
if you know what you're doing, go for it. If you don't, you probably shouldn't fuck with it. Um. Now, as, as, as for motherboards, you know, you said there's thirty or you say thirty or sixty. You said sixty and three hundred dollar difference. Sixty to three hundred dollar range. Uh, uh, personally, I don't know that I'd ever buy a sixty dollar motherboard. No. Because no. I'd be too afraid of, okay, I've, I've dropped $300 on this processor. I'm going to slap this in a $60 mother. Oh, look at all those pretty colors. Remember what we were talking about at the start of the show with the rating, the power ratings, on, and, and how plugging in to one of the cheap uh, motherboards, plugging a 480 RX into a cheap motherboard could kill it because it couldn't handle the power? Aftermarket motherboards, people like Gigabyte, Asus, EVG, EVGA, they overbuild their motherboards. They make them capable of handling power spikes. They make them capable of overclocking. They make them capable of handling more demands on it than, say, a normal office gray box. Do they even still yeah. make gray boxes? Or are they all black now? I miss I miss the beige boxes. I miss them. Um, um, now, this is not to say that some of these brands don't have something in the 30 60 you know, 50 $60 range. Um, they do, but it's generally end-of-life stuff or we overproduced, no one's buying it, we're selling it cheap to get rid of it. Your maintenance may not be there, your support may not be there, drivers not being updated, things like that. When it comes to a motherboard, I would not spend less than $100 on a motherboard. And you can get a Bare pretty good motherboard for $100 to $125. What you need to look for mainly with a motherboard is the chipset. Um, now, in this case, you're trying to get the 6600 Skylake. It's an 1151 uh, socket motherboard. Yeah, so you're going to be looking for a socket 1151. and Because if you don't match these things, you've just wasted money. Right. I'm looking at the chipsets for 1151. Um, you want to get, I would personally, for me... Just to, to be a little safe, make sure the chipset on the motherboard is Z170. There are a lot of different ones that offer it. Z170 is the Intel. The chipset is basically how motherboard talk to everything on motherboard. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing a Q170 and an H170. I'm not seeing a Z170. You haven't seen the Z170? I'm, I'm on Newegg's site right now, and perhaps I'm just, fil I filtered down and I'm not including it. No, they, they make them. Asus has a Z170. Fact, well, I was filtering by price, so let me take a look again yeah. without price filtering. It, it'll Asus's Z170 is uh, $170, which a little high end. Oh, but, there it is. Yeah. Z170 has a lot of features on it, but you know what? If you're not going to be overclocking, if you're not going to be doing a terrible amount of super uber shit on it, you just want to just plug in and play, the Q170 will work too. The Q170 is a, a slightly different cheap chipset, but it will work. And, and there, like I say, there's, there's MSI motherboards out there right now in, in that Z170 in the 115 to 140 range, yeah. uh, Gigabyte 150s, uh, Asus 160s. So you can find something relatively, you don't have to spend $300. And if you want to, you can, but. I would, I would just, just for my own safety, I would personally not buy anything cheaper than 150. A hundred dollars would be my absolute floor for a motherboard. Anything below that, I would not trust it to keep my components safe. Now, if someone else is paying for this and you don't have to use it, you know, and they want to go cheap, and you're just building it for them, yeah. Uh even then, I wouldn't build something for someone. Yeah, and I'd try to talk them into it. Yeah, I, I'd say 150 would be my my bottom floor. That's my personal one. I would, and anything below 100, no, no, no. But, that, but that's, at the same time, I see no reason to go to the three four hundred dollar range either. And there are a lot of different features these motherboards have. Some have more PCI slots. Some hold more memory. Some have different uh, audio outputs. Some have more USB ports. Some have specialized ports on them. If you know what you're looking for, look through those features specifically. If you could couldn't care less about those sorts of things, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. 
just make sure you get from a reputable manufacturer, Asus, Gigabyte, EVGA, MSI. Uh, MSI. Those are our reputable motherboard makers. They w If there's a problem with the motherboard, they will cover it. They, they are good in customer service. They will look after you. And just any, just don't go cheap. Don't. You have to understand a computer is not one piece. It's all of its pieces together. And if you cheap out on any one piece, you will regret it because the whole thing will just go through. Blah, 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 blah. It will always be. Normally, I've all what I what I tend to see with repairing computers that not always. Sometimes the most expensive thing ends up being a point of failure. But with computers, the least expensive thing in it usually ends up being the biggest fucking point of failure in computer repair shit. So don't don't try to save yourself like 30 bucks on a cheap ass mother. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You're not saving any money in the long run. You're fucking yourself in the long run. You, you might as well just go out and spend that money on a really expensive dildo because that's what you're going to be doing to yourself. Is all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> I managed to work dicks into the show. I'm so happy. It's your superpower. It is my superpower. Dicks! All right. Well, folks. Uh, and someone asked in the channel, what about motherboards with older processor slots? Well, yes, those are going to be cheaper just because no one's buying. No, right. One, they're ancient. It's, it's, it's supply and demand. People are going, oh, these are it's, it's taking up uh, warehouse space. Let's knock a, uh, $25, $50 off of them to get them out of here. But if you're buying new for new components, if you're buying brand spanking new stuff, especially for modern process, brand new processors, don't cheap out. Don't do that to yourself. You're no, no. Because if you build a good computer, it'll, it'll last you several years. No, don't cheap out. And always, never, never cheap out on your power supply. Because the power supply is how electricity gets through your entire computer. And if you cheap out on that, you're letting a crazy person. That's sort of like having a little crazy person in your computer with fire. Who couldn't any. That's like hiring. You have someone who has to handle it. It's, it's hiring the Muppet with the explosives to rewire your house. Yes. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's bad. Oh, okay, Mike. Well. Uh, folks, that's going to do it for this edition. If you have questions, you can send those to us at request at radio.air.com. We will attempt to answer those for you. Um, for Mike and myself, that's going to take care of it. Everybody, see you back here next time. Good night. <laughs>